Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero, and today we are Chrono Gaming with Power. Nintendo Power. As we continue with our Nintendo Power retrospective for issue two of the Fun Club News for summer of 1987. We start the magazine off with another title in the Nintendo canon. Legend of Zelda. As with the last issue, we don't have any screenshots, but we do have some art of the characters, and we get a rundown of the game's plot. For the game itself, well, odds are high that, like with Super Mario Bros., you've probably played this game on at least one system or another. This game is a classic, and it's considered that way for very good reasons. The game provides a massive world for the player to explore, and as the player makes their way from dungeon, dungeon to dungeon, they'll get new items and abilities to help them through their way. The game is often compared to RPGs, a comparison I'd consider valid. True, you're not earning experience points and leveling up in the usual fashion that you'd consider for RPGs, but the game makes up for that by having a world that encourages the player to explore and take their time with the game, as opposed to taking a direct route like you're seeing me do now. As it is, gaining hard containers to expand your life bar is kind of like leveling, and you do end up grinding for cash for item upgrades like candles to light up runes and upgraded shields and other sorts of things. As it is, like Super Mario Bros., this game's controls are excellent, and the game itself manages to juggle the fine line of being easy to pick up and play, and complex enough to keep you learning new things and keep you on your toes all at the same time. Next up is a couple of sports games, Volleyball and Slalom. <laughs> kind of like Excite Bike Last Issue, is a game that plays very well, but is ultimately kind of underwhelming. You choose your volleyball team and then play an opposing team in a full-length game of volleyball. The game controls and plays very well, making it easy to tell where the ball is going to land, and also making it easy for you to get under the ball so you can return your to your opponent. However, I did have problems getting the hang of aiming the ball once it came to returning it outside of the serve. So, since, that was, since that's the key to success in volleyball, is shooting the ball where the opposing team's players aren't, I kind of ended up sucking at the game. And, well, I kept shooting the balls directly to the opposing players. That sounded wrong. Anyway, what does make volleyball different from Excite Bike is that it does have a two-player mode, meaning that you have well, the opportunity to play the game against your friends, who will hopefully not be as incredibly good as getting directly under the ball or anticipating where the ball is going to go before you shoot it, as you know the computer is. Um, other than that, though, the game doesn't have any sort of career mode, just one-on-one -on -one games, at least not that I was aware of. So, unless you're in a situation where you can play this game a bunch with friends, I cannot recommend this game to you. <laughs> Slalom is the first game from a company that we'll be seeing a bunch of later on. Rare. This game was originally written for the Nintendo vs. System arcade machine and was later ported to the NES. The game basically is a whole bunch of downhill skiing courses where you have to maintain your best possible speed while also avoiding obstacles like other skiers or trees or obnoxious sledders and also making your way through gates. If you miss a gate, you lose speed, which works a little like the time penalties in real-world slalom, but in a fashion that I think works better for a video game. The game offers three mountains with about six tracks each for a total of 18 tracks. The game also has a real sense of progression in this, in that, unlike Excite Bike, you can't select your track from the beginning as far as you can select your mountain, 
but you can't go through each of the 16 tracks just at a whim. You have to go through them in order. So it really gives a sense of having to go through the game in a career mode rather than just getting everything from the very beginning and theoretically allowing you to play each track all at, at any time like an excite bike. Also, as you go through the game, you get a score at the end of each race based on how much time you have left and any tricks you've done on your way down the slope. This in turn gives you several seconds based on your point total where there are no skiers on the track giving you a little bit of an extra edge early on. So it encourages you to try and cut time off of your run as well as hitting those tricks so that you actually get a little easier next time. It's a pretty good game mechanic. After this comes pro wrestling. The article in the magazine itself features a discussion of the game's mechanics as well as some anime style portraits of the characters. This on its own is kind of significant as, well, later games for consoles would basically excise anything Japanese or anime styled until anime, well, got popular on American television with shows like Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon getting broadcast on, well, broadcast channels instead of being just on cable. Anyway, the game itself is fair. The game gives a small selection of pro wrestlers, approximately six, who end up facing about three to four times each over the course of a run through the game, sometimes more. You'll end up facing each wrestler in a one-fall match, as is customary with wrestling games around this time, and you win by pinfall or countout outside the ring. There's no submission holds, there are signature moves, but they're not sort of the kind of mega damage moves that you'd see in more recent wrestling games. They basically do as much damage as other moves do. They're not really special outside of having a special animation. The game itself was developed by Mat Ma Masato Matsuda, I apologize for mangling his name, of Tri Incorporated, which would later become Human Entertainment, the series the publishers of the Fire Pro Wrestling series. The gameplay is actually kind of similar to the Fire Pro, Pro series with a few differences. The Fire Pro series is all about timing when you do your moves. Depending on how quickly you hit the buttons to do a move, and not just so much quickly as much as the like precise timing of when they're pressed, that determines who pulls off their moves in a grapple. Whereas here, it's about kind of hitting the buttons quickly, and indeed, if you have a controller with a turbo button, like the NES Max, you can really get an edge over your opponent. There's one other significant sing similarity between the two. The Fire Pro series is well known for having the wrestlers in the game basically be serial numbers filed off versions of real world Japanese pro wrestlers, like Milano Collection AT, or Kenji Muto, or Jushin Thunder Liger, that sort of thing. Some of the characters in Pro Wrestling for the NES also kind of feel like real-world wrestlers with the serial numbers filed off, and in some cases, the appearance dramatically changed. For example, the wrestler Great Panther clearly has in his arsenal the Von Erich family's famous Iron Claw move, and he's also kind of got Carrie Von Erich's hair going on as well. Similarly, the wrestler, the Amazon, though he looks like the creature from the Black Lagoon, he uses a head bite and repeated fork stabs to the forehead, which are some of the signature moves of famous heel pro wrestler, rather infamous heel wrestler, Abdullah the Butcher. I'm not so sure about the rest of the wrestlers, though. If you can think of any connections between the wrestlers in the game and some real-world Japanese wrestlers, or American wrestlers for that matter, in terms of their move list and what their signature moves are, please let me know in the comments. The game also features a two-player mode, which basically consists of a best two out of three falls match. In the pro's corner column, we get some more Super Mario Bros. tricks, including a way to get a small, fiery Mario. I'm not sure why you'd want a small, fiery Mario, since as you're still small, you still go out in one hit. We also get a really tough way for getting 50,000 points in the castles, as well as the Infinite Lives Turtle trick, which was kind of teased the last issue in the Celebrity Mario Tournament article, or at least that was the trick that was used by Will Wheaton to win the tournament. So, yeah. We also get an article on the NES Advantage, 
the new aftermarket controller for the NES, featuring rapid fire and an arcade stick. I own one, and it doesn't work for all games, really. It's kind of clunky when it comes to RPGs, and even with games like Castlevania, there are some times where it feels a little unwieldy to me. Maybe it's just I have an older one, and it's getting a little finicky in its old age. On the human interest front, there's an article on the second annual Recycled Robot Contest, which is basically a grade school art project contest where you make robots out of scrap. Robots in quotes. Why is this getting mentioned in the newsletter? Well, because the winner got an NES, so presumably if they sent in their membership card on time, they might be getting an issue of this magazine. On the upcoming titles front, there is mention given of Metroid, as well as a list of upcoming NES titles with no descriptive information. Considering that this is a list in Nintendo's own magazine, and theoretically the best possible way in their eyes to hype upcoming titles for their system, you'd think they'd do a better job of promoting them. We also get some high scores from Mario, and a call for people to submit their strategies and descriptions for how they beat Ganon in Legend of Zelda. And finally, to cover up the it's fun to work for Nintendo side of things, there's an article describing Howard Phillips' high-flying, jet-setting, wheeling-dealing lifestyle as WCW heavyweight champ, er, um, I mean president of the Nintendo Fun Club. For some reason, I ended up confusing Howard Phillips and Ric Flair. Oh well, it's an easy mistake to make. After an order form for some merch, primarily t-shirts, and none of which I can find on eBay, so I can't tell you how much they go for now, we come to the letters column, which consists almost entirely of requests for information that are in this issue already, thus making the letters column less useful than an editorial column that rehashes the table of contents. Now for, well, now for my picks of the issue. As with the last issue, it's a fairly easy choice to do. Legend of Zelda, really, it's a classic. It's a classic for very, very good reasons. Frankly, you, as I said in the review, you've probably played this in some form or another. You probably own this in some form or number, al another already. If you don't, why don't you? It's been released on the Virtual Console. It's been released, of course, Virtual NES. Um, I believe a couple Legend of Zelda Wii releases came with a emulated version of the original game. Um, honestly, you, you should own this. It is a piece of the Nintendo canon. So if you don't own it, get it. It also has the advantage of it's one of those retro game classics, which are also really affordable. Because so many of them were put out, so many of them were bought, you can probably pick up this game for maybe not five bucks, but like, you know, the five to ten dollar range. Maybe a little more. Certainly less expensive than other classics that are a little less, um, a little less well known or perhaps had a lower print run, particularly the games from third party publishers like, oh, going off the top of my head, uh, Final Fantasy 2 and 3, and that sort of thing. So I strongly recommend picking this up. And if you already own it, Unlike last time, where I didn't have a backup choice, because there wasn't really a, a good backup choice, here I have one. Slalom, from Rare. It is really what Excite Bike should have been. Um, the diversity of, corp of courses, with the three mountains, with about six tracks per mountain, gives you plenty of replay value. It has two-player, which is something Excite Bike lacks, so you can, if you have a friend over, you can play it with them. The only thing it's missing is it's missing a track creator. But even then, there's enough gameplay here that you can play this for a while and get get a decent amount of playtime out of it if you're buying games for something other than just collection. If you're buying buying games because you want something to play. So I again definitely recommend Solemn. Solemn. As for next time, knock on wood. I'm gonna try to get this one out in time for Halloween. And since next week is ha is Halloween, let's do a horror movie review. Let's take a page out of the Criterion Collection, or rather a film from the Criterion Collection, as I take a look at Quaidan. Until next time, thank you for watching.